So today we want to continue our series on our 2022 theme, which is Arise. Thank you for arising from bed this morning and coming to God's house. Our theme is based on one verse. Uh, I shared two of them, but the first verse is the one it's based on. But I want to share both verses. It's found in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. And uh, I want to go ahead and read that. It says, Arise, shine. Why? For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. So we need to arise and shine. Why? Because the glory of the Lord has shone upon us. We can do it, right? And why do we need to arise and shine? Because darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But that's okay. We can arise and shine. Why? Because the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. And so we said last week, the fact that, listen, darkness is still around us. I mean, you look across and we live in a culture and a society, and it's really worldwide, where there's a a very real rejection of God and all of his purposes and all the things connected to the one true God. They have no problem you worshiping a false God, just don't worship the true God, right? But that's okay. That's why we're still on this earth, because we are, because of Jesus and in him and his person and the work of Christ, we have the glory of the Lord, we have the, the light of Jesus, and we are able to shine as the church of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, the Lord is at the right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession for us, but he didn't leave this world hopeless. Who did, who did he leave on this earth? You. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking about you. He left the church, and through the church, God's work is still done. Through the church, Jesus is still represented. Through the church, the light and the glory of God can and will shine. And so our focus in 2022 as a church body, as a church family, is to do the very thing that God said through Isaiah to us, to arise and to go forth and be the light that we're supposed to be. Go forth and shine. I said last week that as God's people, it's time to stop playing church and doing church, and it's time for us to start being the church. We need to be the church of Jesus Christ. That means that no matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, we have a mission to fulfill. We know what that mission is, and we've got to do it. If you missed last week's message, I encourage you to please, please watch it or listen to it. It's on our our, our, our Play Me First app. It's on our website as well. But but it, it lays the foundation for this entire series and really for the entire year and what we mean by when we say arise, arise, arise. And so during this entire series, we're looking at four general things that as believers in Jesus Christ, we can arise to. And I believe that as we begin to arise to these four things, that we will begin to shine a lot brighter, that we will begin to actually fulfill the mission of Jesus the way we're supposed to fulfill the mission of Christ. And we're going to be this type of church until when? Until Jesus comes back. We're not just emphasizing this through 2022, which we are, obviously, but the reason we're emphasizing it in 2022, just like every other emphasis throughout the previous 11 years, is because we want to be that kind of church for the rest of our lives until Christ comes back or we go to see him. One of the two, right? So the four areas, last week we looked at the fact that we we must arise and go. That means that we need to go forward. There has to be advancement. There has to be some movement. We can't just sit back and say, arise, but I'm going to sit back and recline. No, arise and go. There has to be some action. Again, if you missed it, please watch it. Next week, we're going to look at arise and serve. Turn to somebody and say, we've got to serve. See, Jesus didn't leave that um, as as guesswork for us. He made it very clear for us. In fact, he elevated servanthood to the highest possible position in the kingdom of God, which means that when we are not fulfilling that servanthood, when we're not fulfilling that position, we're missing out in our lives, and obviously we're short-circuiting the the mission of God on this earth. Now today what I want to do is I want to look at a very basic thing that all of us as followers of Jesus must understand and must practice, and that is praise. And so today we're looking at the fact that we need to arise and praise. Arise and praise. So how many know that you need the help of God to do that? How many know that you need the help of God to arise to any and every one of these issues? So let's pray right now and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand this very important subject. Father, thank you so much for your grace, 
God, the grace that encompasses every area of our lives, the grace that allows us to be here in a moment like this, the grace that has preserved your living word for thousands of years so that on a moment like this, in a morning like this, we can actually look into it and learn your principles, your precepts, the precepts of abundant life that you died to give us. So Holy Spirit, we we acknowledge our dependence on you. We understand that these are spiritual truth that must be spiritually discerned. And so we need your help and we're asking for it and we are receiving it right now. And we're believing that before we leave this house today, we will have a good understanding of this concept and Lord, that we will be able to practice it to the fullness of our abilities through your grace and power. And we pray all these things for your glory and your honor in Jesus name. All God's people said, Amen. all right, in just a moment, I'm going to I'm going to have you turn to Psalm 103. It's one of the greatest psalms of praise that you'll find in Scripture, a very popular, very familiar portion of Scripture, one of my personal favorites. Um, And so we're going to look at that psalm and just pull some principles of the what and the why of praise from it. But before I do that, I want to just kind of give you an overview of this very important subject of praise and worship. Now, obviously, if you've been around PFA for any period of time, you know that just about every year or every other year, we do an entire series on praise and worship. And so we take four or five, sometimes we've taken even six weeks just to cover the understanding of what praise and worship encompasses. So there's no way that I'm going to be able to give you every detail and every important aspect of this incredibly um, essential part of our lives, which is praise and worship. But I do want to give you kind of just a quick overview before we actually take some time to practice what we say we believe and to practice what we know and learn. And so let me just start by giving you a basic, just this is my basic uh, uh, definition of praise. It's going to be on the screens there. And that's this. Praise is this. It's our reverent joyful, and what's the next word there? And expressive adoration of God in response to who he is and what he has done. So praise is always a response to who God is and what he has done in our lives. There are some people that cannot praise because they have nothing to respond to because they've never experienced the true God, right? But for us who have experienced God, know who he is, have experienced who he is, and experienced his work in our lives, then praise is the response to what he has done and who he is in our lives. And it is an expressive adoration. Turn to somebody and say, you got to express it. So what is praise? Praise is simply declaring the things that are true about God. It's just what it is. It's basically bragging on God. Now, some of y'all are going to be able to brag on the cowboys this afternoon, hopefully. How many say yes to that? I agree. (laughs) And so you'll be bragging on what Dak might have done or or Zeke or what the defense did. You might be bragging on that. You're actually, what you're doing is you're actually praising your football team, right? And that's what praise is, but it's not directed to some temporary thing like football. It's it's, It's directed to the eternal God of the universe who happens to also call himself our father. And so praise is always bragging on who God is and what he has done in our lives. Now, let me just give you a a working definition of worship. And and it's hard to separate those two, but I want to just, for the sake of argument, just go ahead and give you a definition for worship that is a little more all-encompassing. And I want you to see the difference between worship and praise, right? So worship is how we value God. Worship is the attitude the adoration of the heart, right? It's the attitude of adoration from the heart. So worship is internal. Worship is found in our hearts. It's found deep in our spirits. It is found deep in our hearts. It's our estimation of God. It's our worship, is our adoration. It's how we value God in our lives. So here's the deal. You can worship God without a sound. You're sitting in his house today, And as an act of your will, you came and you chose to come and and be attentive to his word. That is actually worship. You are sitting here silently listening to his word, being taught and expounded on, and you are actually worshiping God. So you can sit in silence and worship God. You can stand at the Grand Canyon 
Or you can watch a beautiful West Texas sunset with your hands in your pocket or a cup of coffee in your hand, and you are worshiping God, and you can worship God in your heart. But Jesus said that there is a greater element to this, and the scripture teaches there's a greater element to worship. Jesus said there's actually a difference between true worshipers and those that are not true worshipers. He says the Father seeks true worshipers in John chapter 4, he says. And he says those true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. So we worship according to the scriptures. That's the truth. We worship according to the knowledge of who we know God is and what scripture says worship is. So when it comes to true worship, especially corporate worship, where we have all gathered together as the people of God, there's an actual actual side to worship that is a testimony to those around us, whether saved or not saved, right? So when you look at that, true worship involves more than just sitting there with your hands in your pocket or with a cup of coffee in your hand. Matter of fact, when you study the scriptures and you read all the words that are used, both in the Old Testament in the Hebrew and in the New Testament in the Greek, when you study the words that incorporate what worship is, when you see what all it involves, you come to the conclusion that worship always involves two two specific things. Worship always includes attitudes and actions. It always includes attitudes and actions. And by attitudes, we mean awe, reverence, honor, admiration, and love. Now, those are found where? Internally. Those come from within the heart. Those come from your soul, from your spirit, right? So those are internal. But the internal attitude of worship must always come forth in the external aspect of actions. And actions, when you read the scriptures, bowing, praising, serving. The actual words that are used that are many times translated worship or translated praise are bowing, praising, serving. So here's what I have come to the conclusion from scripture is that action is the expression of the heart's attitude. And when I say action, you can actually say praise. Because praise is the action of worship. Attitude begins in the heart, but that attitude must be expressed through action. So turn to somebody and say, you gotta do something. See, when we engage in the action of praise, what we're doing is that we're giving voice to the adoration of our hearts. We're we're letting the adoration of our hearts make its way outward so that others can hear, so that God can hear, so that we can testify to the fact that God has done some great and mighty things in our lives and that he is worthy of our praise. So when the Bible tells us to praise him, And it does, over and over and over again. There's an entire Psalm 100 that says, praise him. If you have breath, Psalm 150, if you have breath, you ought to be what? Praising him. So over and over, we see that he tells us to praise. What the Bible is actually telling us to do is to go ahead and give expression to the heart that is inside of us, and that should be an adoring heart of God. So whether the song is slow or fast, or whether there's no song at all, maybe it's just a shout, maybe it's an applause. Listen, all of that is irrelevant when it comes to praise, because we are called to express the adoration of our hearts. The Bible goes as far to say, listen, if it takes a joyful noise, go ahead and make it. Just make that joyful noise, but express what's happening inside of you. So when we say well, I'm praising, I'm just praising silently. That's an oxymoron. I'm not calling anybody a name. That's actually a word, oxymoron. It's the opposite of what it really is. You cannot praise silently. I need to say that again. You cannot, I cannot praise silently. You may be reverencing. You may be adoring. But praise requires action or voice. 
You can leave this place and you can go home and you can say, I'm going to serve my family today and I'm going to serve my God. And you can start cleaning the bathroom and you don't have to say a word, but you can be worshiping God by doing that. But still there's action involved. There's some kind of action involved. But praise, worship always, always, always requires expression. For example, it's not just for God. If you, you can value and esteem your best friend, you can, you can value and esteem your husband or your wife, you can value and esteem your child, your, your children, you can have a heart of adoration towards them, and I, and I hope and I pray that you do, but at some point, you need to do some things that express your value of them. At some point, you need to articulate how much they mean to you. And by the way, that takes an act of the will to do that. So turn to somebody and say, you got to choose to do that. See, gratefulness always begins where? Gratefulness always begins in the heart. But gratefulness must always make its way to the lips if it's going to have its full impact. How many like to, say, to be told every so often, thank you? Right? If you're married to somebody who never says thank you or I love you, it makes an impact on your life. And if you go to them and say, you never say thank you, well, I, I did in my heart. <laughs> well, good for you. Because it always has to be expressed. And see, that's the point of every biblical command to praise. It's about doing something physically that articulates and expresses thanks for what God has done for you. Always. For instance, God gives us some biblical examples. Some, in his word, he gives us examples of clapping, of singing. And by the way, I would say that probably, I can't remember a time when singing isn't mentioned in scripture where it's not singing loudly. Singing loudly. It speaks about dancing, playing instruments, lifting hands, bowing, kneeling, and, you, and, and the list goes on. Go through the scriptures and see the different actions that are spoken of in scripture regarding the expression of our worship through praise. And based on what I read in scriptures, praise is not something of an option for us as God's people. In fact, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, praise is not just what you do. Praise is who you are. You are a praiser. Worship is not just what you do. Worship is who you are. You're a worshiper. If you're a follower of Christ, it's not an option. If we know who God is, we need to give him the praise that he's worthy of. Amen? Amen. Now listen, why then does God over and over tell us to praise him? Why is it that his word exhorts us to praise him? Because we, as human beings, are broken. We have been broken by sin. And that sin, listen, we have an inborn tendency to be inward focused because of sin. And so we tend, so we tend to, to let all kinds of inner obstacles keep us from giving full expression to our praise. And so God says, I know that right now you're broken, but I didn't create you broken. I created you to worship me. I created you to be a praiser and so I want you to start living out your original, original intent. So begin to praise me. And so he has to, he has to command us. He has to exhort us to do just that. Because our natural tendency is to think about whom? Ourselves. So we like comfort. We like a little bubble. We like to be just in the background. We don't want to sound stupid. We don't want to sound bad. We don't want to look foolish. And so God says, that's besides the point. That has nothing to do with me. Arise and praise. Listen to what the priest of Nehemiah's day exhorted the people to do. Come on, say those first two words. Arise and praise. Whom? The Lord your God. For how long? <laughs> I want you to notice that that's not a, listen, praise is not a temporary deal. There's no expiration date on our praise. And if, if he is the Lord your God, then you and I need to praise him for how long? 
forever and ever into eternity. Listen, y'all, you're, you're going to spend eternity praising God. You might as well start getting used to it now. You might as well start practicing now. The praise team that's just led us into the throne room of God this morning, they didn't just show up and do it. They actually practiced so they can give God the best. We need to practice our praise. If you believe that, say amen, because some of you don't look like you believe it. So look at that verse again. Go ahead and put that verse back up, please, in Nehemiah. So it says, arise and praise the Lord your God forever and ever. So, so the, the end result or the outcome of this command is for us to do what? Praise the Lord your God forever and ever. That's the, that's the, that's the, the outcome of what he says. Listen, I, if you do what I'm asking you to do, you're going to praise the Lord forever and ever. But notice the prerequisite. The prerequisite is Arise. He doesn't just say, praise the Lord your God forever and ever. First, he says, arise. Why? Because we are broken people who have a natural tendency to be inward focused. And we need to be <laughs> arisen. Arise. Right? Remember we said last week that, that to arise means to stand, to rise up, to come onto the scene. Right, you're not there, let's, let's get there. Let's show up, right? I said it was about changing positions. So praise requires a changing of positions. It requires a change of posture. And I'm not just talking about physical posture. I'm not talking about just a physical changing of positions, although that's included. But I'm also talking about a spiritual and mental change of posture as well. If you are spiritually dead because you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, there has to be a spiritual change of posture from someone who is dead and cannot praise God to someone who is alive and cannot help but praise God. But there's also this mental change of posture that every one of us must go through. The Bible says that our life is transformed through the renewing of the mind. Therefore, there has to be a mental change of posture some of us are in the mental chain, a, a, a posture, a mental posture of saying, you know what, I don't do this because it makes me uncomfortable, or I don't do this because it makes me look weird, or I don't sing because I don't, I don't like the sound of my voice, and it's all inward turned. And the mental change of posture has to go from this to that, from inward to upward, and there has to be that. Because there's a tendency to let our feelings lead the way to our actions. Let me say that again. We as human beings that are broken have a tendency to let our feelings lead our way to our actions. Unless, of course, there's something that will be very detrimental to us if we don't do what we're supposed to do. For instance... I'm sure there are days that some of you don't feel like arising from bed and going to school. But you arise and go because not to go would be very detrimental to you. And all the parents said. Amen. And some of you don't feel like arising from bed and going to work some days. Can I get an amen? amen. But you arise and go because not to go will be very detrimental to you. You might lose your job, a way to pay your bills. So you do it. You get up and go no matter how you feel. Some of you probably didn't feel like arising from bed and gathering with your church family to worship today in this house, right? But you arose and came because some of you have discovered that when you don't come, it becomes kind of detrimental to you in your spiritual walk with God. So you came. So the point I'm trying to make is this, that all of us have to learn to make choices. All of us. And it's based on what we know is good and right, and it's not based on our feelings. You know what it's called? That's called maturity. The more mature we get, the more we recognize that our feelings cannot dictate what we do. We have to do what is right and what is, and what is not going to be detrimental and what is going to be beneficial. And so we move forward based on our choices, not our feelings. Amen? 
It's no different when it comes for us, when it comes time for us to arise and praise. No different. It's a choice we make. Come on, turn to somebody else and say, it's a choice. And I think that that's what was going on in David's life. The psalmist, the great king of Israel. He wrote the psalm, Psalm 103. And, uh, and this is how he starts it off in Psalm 103, verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Now, I want you to see what David is doing here. He's talking to himself. How many of you talk to yourself? It's all right. It's all right. If you start having like long conversations, then maybe we need to have a little counseling session. But, uh, but listen, all of us talk to ourselves all the time. We all, listen, you talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody else. There's always self-talk going on. Always. Some of it's good. Most of it's bad. It is. And so, and so what David is doing here, he's talking to his soul. He's talking to himself. He's actually commanding himself. Now, I don't know what David found himself in that he's having to command himself to praise God. But notice that he had to do that. Right? Now, if you know David's life, man, it could have been a number of things. The guy, poor guy, went through all kinds of stuff before he actually became king. And, and so he was being trying uh, assassination attempts. Uh, he was constantly being pursued. I mean, all kinds of junk. So you don't know if it was something that was going on around him, something that was going on inside him. We don't know. I don't think it was apathy because he was a man after God's own heart. And if David was anything else, nothing else, he was a worshiper of God. But whatever was causing him to at this moment feel, not feel like worshiping, he says, listen, I don't need to succumb to these feelings. I don't need to say, well, I don't feel like it, so I'll just wait till tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow morning I'll feel like it. Maybe next Sunday I'll feel like it. Maybe, maybe, maybe on Friday night during night of worship I'll feel like it. No, he said, I don't care what I feel like now. He says, listen, I am not going to give in to my feelings I'm going to choose to praise. And he actually commands, in essence, he is commanding his soul, which by the way, most of us understand the soul to be the, the mind, the will, and the emotions. So he is saying emotions line up. Mind line up. Will line up. It's time to choose. And I'm telling you right now, he says, I'm commanding you, soul, to praise the Lord. But David didn't stop there. He said, listen, not just my soul. Listen, all that is within me, all my inmost being. Listen to me, soul. Listen to me, all that is in me. Listen, my breath, my mind, my soul, my spirit, my strength. I'm not holding anything back. I'm commanding myself to give God the highest praise. I'm not leaving anything on the shelf. I'm giving him everything that he is worthy of. That's what he's saying. Why? Why? Because of his holy name. Praise his holy name. The God's, God's name in scripture is always, it always speaks of who he is. It's his attributes, his character, his, his personality. Everything that God is, everything God encompasses that God is, that's his name. His name encompasses everything that he is. And he says, listen, Soul, you need to stand up. Everything in me, you need to stand up. You need to rise and praise because of who he is. His name is worthy to be praised. So he commands his soul. So you may not feel like it, but he's still worthy. You may not want to, but he's still worthy. You may like feel like you've been done wrong, but he's still worthy. Someone may have hurt you and you're walking in her feelings, but he's still worthy. Praise his holy name. Listen, if you're always depending on someone else to get you to the point where you want to praise, come on, turn to somebody and say, you're in trouble. I've seen people come to service and almost dare the worship leader. I dare you to make me want to praise. And then I get up to preach and they're doing the same. I dare you to make me move from this place right here. Listen, we need to reverse that attitude. We need to come to worship with God's people in God's presence, daring anyone to keep us 
from praising the Lord. I dare you to do something. I dare you to say something that will keep me from praising my God. Because friends, there will always be times in your walk with God when the music doesn't move you, when the preaching won't move you, when the people around you praising God are not gonna move you. So there's only one person that's gonna move you, and that's you. You need to move yourself to praise. And like David, you need to start learning how to do a little self-talking and say, Saul, I ain't asking. I'm telling you, it's time to praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, Saul, let me, let me just say this. Let everything, everything inside of me, every breath, every heartbeat, every thought, everything in me, praise the Lord. Why? Because his name is worthy to be praised. And then just in case his soul wasn't listening the first time, David repeats the command in verse 2. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And soul, don't you forget. Don't you forget all his benefits. You don't feel like praising him, really? Really? Don't you remember all that he's done for you? Friends, when I find myself not feeling like, like, not feeling like praising God, and I, and I do, I'm like human like everybody else. There are times when I don't feel like praising God. All I have to do is remember where I was when he found me and he wrapped his arms around me and I can't help but start praising him. All I have to do is remember that when I, in my sin, almost died several times, the Lord in his mercy, because I wanted nothing to do with him, but in his mercy, he kept me, he protected me, and I'm here today because of his grace. When I was broken, he fixed me. When I didn't have anything, he gave me everything. When I was in bondage, he set me free. When I was lost, he found me. When I was dead in my sins, he gave me new life. He raised me to new life, abundant life in all of his glory. I'm telling you that the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised because of who he is and because of what he's done for you. Now ask somebody next to you, what's he done for you? Because sometimes we need to remind our soul don't forget all the benefits and the blessing the Lord has brought into your life. I heard this recently, and, I, and I've been, when I walk the dog every so often, I want it to turn into a gratitude walk. Seriously. Where you walk, and all you do is just thank the Lord for what he's done for your life. And I look at my life sometimes, and it's, it's sometimes it's hard for me to believe that I've been where I've been and done what I've done, and it's all because of the grace of Jesus. Pastor Regina, I talk about it often when we were kids growing up with barely anything and how God has blessed us. How can we not praise him, friends? How can we not praise him? So he says, listen, soul, I don't want you to forget the benefits of the Lord. If you need a little reminding, let me remind you of some things that maybe will stir up some praise in you, right? And so what do we, what do we remind, what benefits should we focus on when we want and need to praise and we don't feel like it? Well, number one, for starters, Psalm 103 says he forgives all your sins. All your sins. Aren't you glad it doesn't say some of your sins? Not some. Well, that one, that one there was just, no, all, all of our sins. God didn't look back over my life and say, well, I can forgive this and I can forgive that, but this one, whoo, buddy, that, I can't cover that one. That's not God. When I came to Jesus, listen, he already knew me and he still loved me. When he laid down his life on the cross, he knew you. He knew me and he still loved us because Calvary was for us. Calvary's cross was not for some of your sins. Calvary's cross and the blood that Jesus shed on that cross was not for some of your sins. It was for all of your sins. Now, I don't know about you, but man, when I think about my sins, I don't want to just give him a little, I want to shout, I want to jump, I want to praise him because he's forgiven me a whole bunch. All your sins. He knew the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he still loved me. 
So when the devil tries to bring up your past, all your mistakes, all your failures, just ignore him. And you begin to speak not to him. I don't talk to the devil much. He's not worthy of me talking to him. But I'll start talking to my soul. Don't forget. Yeah, I remember that sin. Yeah, yeah, I remember that mistake. Yeah, yeah, that's part of me is still ashamed of that. But soul, he forgave all those sins. It's all under the blood. It's all under the blood of Jesus. So if God has forgiven all of your sins, then you all have no problem when it comes time to arise and praise. Come on, say it with me. Arise and praise. Say it again. Arise and praise. And then we can praise him because the second part of Psalm, of verse number three says this, he heals all your diseases. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I've been sick many times for the years. I see people here today who at one point were very, very sick. I see people here today that at one point, they, people didn't know which way it was going to go. And yet they're sitting here today ready to arise and praise. Why? Because God healed them. You see, I've been to doctors. I believe in doctors. I believe God gives wisdom to doctors. And I've taken medicine that through the years. I've been hospitalized and those nurses and, and doctors took great care of me. But every one of them would probably agree with me. They didn't heal me. They just applied medicine. But God is the one who healed me. He's the only one that can heal. Jesus is the great physician. And by his stripes, we are healed. So if I need reason to praise the Lord, all I have to do is think about his healing touch. Amen. What about you? Amen. What about you here today? Has God ever touched you? Amen. Has he ever healed you? Amen. Has he ever brought you through some place or some kind of situation where you didn't think you were going to get through it, but here you are today ready to arise and praise because he heals all of your diseases. If you have and you're clapping, then you have no problem. You should have no problem when it comes time to do what? To arise and praise. To do what? Arise and praise. And then we can praise him because he redeems your life from the pit. I think that's one of my favorite. Because I was in the pits. And every so often I will find myself in the pits. But he's redeemed me. He's purchased me from all and every pit that I will ever find myself in. And so I need to tell my soul, I want you to remember this, soul. You didn't buy your salvation. You didn't earn your salvation. You didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps out of the miry pit of sin and despair. No, so remember this. You were bound for hell. You were scheduled for destruction. The work order had already been written, but Jesus stepped into the scene and he took your place. He looked down at a worthless life and said, I'll take him, I'll pay the price, I'll rescue him. And God in Christ brought you out of the slave market of sin and set you free. I owed a debt I could not pay and he paid a debt he didn't no, and he redeemed me from the pit of destruction. And he did the same to you if you're a follower of Jesus. So soul, if you need a reason to praise the Lord, remember where you were. Remember where, where you are now and who brought you here. And I dare you. I dare you not to praise him. I dare you not to praise him when you think about where you were and the pit you were in and where he has put you. He has put your feet on a solid rock today and you were sinking when he found you. So I dare you not to praise the Lord. Has God redeemed your life from the pit? then you ought to have no problem when it comes time to arise and praise. And don't you dare forget to praise him for the fact that he crowns you with love and compassion. I love that. He didn't just redeem us, buy us back, and then let us go. But instead, he pulled us out of the garbage heap of the world and then sent us off clean. He didn't send us off dirty and dying. No, he cleaned us up. Listen, y'all, you don't need to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus, he'll clean you up. He's still cleaning me up. Right? 
He turned my life around. He turned your life around. He put your feet on solid ground. And then he put a crown on your head. What kind of crown? A crown of love and compassion. In verse 8, he says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. Ooh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad God isn't quick-tempered. I wouldn't be here right now. I'll tell you right now. He's slow to anger, yet he's abounding in what? In love. In love. He didn't deal with us according to our failures. He doesn't execute the judgment that we deserve, but instead he shows compassion. In verse 10, David says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. What does he do instead? He crowns us with love and compassion. Think about that. We walk around with a crown, not because we're big-headed and it can fit. We walk around with a crown, not because of our good works. We walk around with a crown but it's because of his love and compassion. And when people say, what's that crown about? Well, it's about his love and compassion. You deserve that crown? No, I don't, but his love and compassion. It's part of my life. It's part of your life. In verse 13, he says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, who reverence him, who awe him in their hearts. Verse 17, he says, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who... F-. You know what? You want to know why we can praise the Lord forever and ever? Because his love is forever and ever. It's from everlasting to everlasting. He didn't have to save us, but he did. He could have very easily dealt with us according to our sins, and we would, be, we would deserve it, and he would be just in doing so. But instead, he dealt with us according to his mercy his love and compassion and the victory that we now have because of Calvary and Jesus' death on that cross. So if God has blessed you with his love and compassion, then you ought to have no problem when it comes time to do what? When it comes time to do what, church? So let's look at one more before we actually do that. Verse number five. Speaking of God, he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Isn't that awesome? I love that. You know why I love that? Because God is such an incredibly generous father. He's such a good God. See, not only does God save us from destruction and put a crown on our head, but he continues to provide us and lead us into this incredible, this incredible quality of life that he called the abundant life or the, 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 the supernatural life, the life of Jesus that is being formed in every one of us. So he doesn't save us and then leave us to ourselves, but he continues to provide everything we need. He gives us the desires of our hearts. He gives us good things. God is a good God and loves to give good things to his, to his children. And so he satisfies our desires with good things. Now, now listen, he doesn't satisfy our desires with all things we want because some of the things we want are not good. But he's so wise and so good, he knows what's good and what's not. So he's not going to give you everything you want, but he will give you the good things you want. He'll give you and satisfy the desires of your heart in that way. He delights in giving good things to his children. And that's why even in the midst of us not focusing on ourselves, can I get an amen? But focusing on him as we just focus on him and give him the praise that he's worthy of, even in the midst of that, he is so good and loves to give the desires of his, hearts, of, of his children's heart to them that he actually begins to move in your life. And he brings, he brings healing and he brings strength and he brings joy and he brings ex, uh, peace and he, and, he, and, he, and he begins to give you back even though we don't deserve it. Now, we don't praise him and worship him to get Amen? Amen. We praise and worship him because he's worthy and because of what he's already done for us. But in his graciousness and his goodness, one of the byproducts of entering in and allowing the adoration of our heart become the expression of our life is that he begins to 
to give us good things. And he renews our strengths like the eagles. Come on, turn to somebody and say, that's how good he is. So has God ever blessed you with his goodness? If he's ever blessed you with his goodness, then you ought to have no problem when it comes time to what? When it comes time to what? And David goes on. He gives a bunch of different listings and all that stuff, all the different benefits. Listen, that's, that's, just, a, that's just the tip of the iceberg for how good God has been to us. But I think you have a good idea. It doesn't matter how you feel this morning. He's worthy to be praised. So stand to your feet, church.